So, that's, that's, my, that's how I feel. I have nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> it's really That's funny. Great. I didn't say, but, but like I will mention, I was at Catalyst a, a, several weeks ago. I, yeah. I was at Catalyst and I was speaking at a lab and stuff, and I, I got done speaking. I talked about Lucretia, and afterwards, um, three black guys came up to me, three black pastors, and they said, "Hey, man, we got a question for you. Is your wife like is she white?" <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> it's great. And they were like, no we, "No, we think that's cool. We just kind of anyway, it was, anyway, it's fine." So. Well, next question. What boundaries should be in place <laughs> for parents and in-laws? <coughs> yeah, you, I'll let you, I'll let you go on this one. Okay. Um, first off, I'd say go back to the first marriage. <laughs> and when you look at Adam and Eve, and it says that, um, you know, we're supposed to leave and cleave. Um, so I think that's definitely a huge, important part of the fact that you're in a marriage with your spouse and you're trying to establish that marriage. And mm. if you're not um, leaving, in, in essence, your parents um, and cleaving to each other, that's going to be um, a lot of difficulties in that marriage. Um, and a lot of communication because sometimes, you know, one spouse may perceive there's a problem um, with the parents or the in-laws and the other spouse doesn't realize that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times you just have to have really good communication about that. And, um, and preferably, I think the spouse should talk to their parents. Um, and you've got to protect your family. So you've got to do what's best for your family um, in regards to the parents and the in-laws. But at the same time, I mean, you know, your parents and your in-laws, that is your... Um, your heritage, that's your family, that's where you came from, that's, you know, your children's grandparents, you want them to be a part of your life, um, but, you know, you've got to do what's best for your family, um, and, you know, with anything, prayer, a lot of prayer is a good thing, and God's guidance and direction, and what to do in your particular situation, um, but for, first and foremost, you know, you've got to do what's right for your family, have boundaries with the parents and the in-laws, but also realize that they're still important to your life and your children's life. Yeah, I, I, I love it when couples, um, I talk to them about the, like, especially when they're engaged and was the family and how, and they go, well, I'm not marrying her family. <laughs> you are. Even the crazy uncle, you get him too. Like you get, it's a package deal. You get it all. And, um, and, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, well, it may not be a bad thing. Um, for some of you, it might be a bad thing. I, I, don't, I don't know your in-law situation. A lot of people, um, you know, G, like Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. You remember that story in Scripture where he healed? And, and then Peter denied him three times. And so I don't know if there's a correlation there or not. But I, I would say it's, it's leave and cleave, like Lucretia said. And you've got to establish the boundaries. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's your marriage. It, and you should, like, if you've got godly parents that have had a great marriage, it's not wrong to seek advice from them. But at the end of the day, it's your marriage, and you've got to make it work. And mama, what mama did, what daddy. And then the other thing I do is we have a lot of fun, and we joke and stuff. But at the end of the day, um, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't call her parents and attack them or say, why did y'all do this? Or da, 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 da. If there's a deal, if there's some conflict that's ever, and I can't even recall conflict since we've been married that's came up with your parents. But if there, I mean, she handles that. I, I kind of handle my side of the family. And we talk about it and dialogue about it, but we don't go on the attack or the offensive. Um, but yeah, so, the, so what boundaries should be put in place for parents and in-laws? Um, first of all, I don't think you... I, I, mean, I think it's dangerous to live with them, except for just a brief period of time, maybe if you're building a house or something like that. But I would, I would say you've got to establish the boundaries that it's your marriage. It's your marriage. Um, and I would actually go a little bit further and say, men, it's up to, it's up to you to establish that. Sometimes it, it might take a very godly conversation with the father-in-law to say, this is our marriage. It might take that. It might. Godly conversation. Not, and if you don't like it, step out in the road and I'll stomp you. That's not, that's, it's, we're in the South and I understand, but don't do that. All right, here we go. Next question. My question is, if you have sex with someone in God's eyes, are you 
consummated, therefore married, what if you have sex with more than one person? Okay. I think this is asking if you have sex with someone, then are you married to them? In God's eyes. In God's eyes. Yes. Um, That's what it's asking. I didn't say yes to the question. Yes. Um, and, <laughs> um, the, the, you know, going back to the first marriage in the Bible, I mean, that was Adam and Eve, and God brought them together, and they were mutually committed to each other in an exclusive relationship for life. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, kind of the first marriage ceremony, marriage covenant before God. Um, so having um, sex with someone does not mean that you're married to them. Um, and having sex with someone apart from that marriage covenant and that commitment to each other for life and in God's eyes, I think is just a setup for a lot of hurt, um, a lot of um, scarring, a lot of hurt for your heart. Um, so I guess the question is, if you have sex with someone, then in God's eyes, are you married to them? And that is no, because there is no commitment there. Um, and if you have sex with more than one person, then again, I mean, you're just setting your heart up for a lot of emotional damage um, because that is something that's special that God designed to be between man and wife, um, an exclusive relationship um, for life. So, Yeah, I, I, I would say the answer to the question is obviously no. And one of the questions I get often asked of me as a pastor is, why do I have to have a ceremony to say that I'm married to a person. Well, because Adam and Eve had a ceremony by God. He, like, he performed the ceremony. It was kind of cool. And, and so, you, like Lucretia said, I mean, you constantly go back to the scriptures. Um, if you have sex with someone, it doesn't mean um, that you consummated a marriage. It means you sinned with them. It means you sinned with them. So you're not consummated in God's eyes. You're, you're kindling. And, like, you, you, should, you should quit that. And for those of you that have had sex with multiple people and you try to justify it, at the end of the day when you're hit the pillow and those memories come back to you at night and they flood at you, you know it's wrong. At the end of the, at, at the, end of the day, uh, when, when, the, when the smoke screen disappears, I mean, you know that it's wrong. And, and, and to go a step further, for, for some of you in this room that have had a sexual past, as I did before I met Christ, you, you know the pain involved with that. So no, um, sex does not mean you're married. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that at all. And so, if, and if you've had sex with more than one person, it doesn't mean you're married to more than one person. So, hope that answers your, your question. Next question: What do submission and headship look like in your marriage? Talk about that. <laughs> okay. You see that? That's what it meant. I told her to talk about it. She said, "Okay." <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, um, I'll pay for that one later. <laughs> Actually, um, what does it look like in our marriage? Um, it really started before our marriage, in a sense. Um, biblically, the headship submission is within marriage, so I don't want to confuse that. So if you're dating someone, the guy does not have that kind of authority in your life Ooh, if you're that's dating good. them. Did you, did you hear that? Say that again, baby. Say that again. If you're dating if, someone... If you're dating someone, then the guy in the relationship does not have that kind of authority in your life until okay, he's your husband. Okay, <laughs> seriously, before you move on, let me, I've, I've had dating guys say, well, my girlfriend needs to submit to me. No, she don't. No, she does not. You, no, she doesn't, and you're a jerk. Knock it off. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, but while we were dating, that's where um, the trust in Perry, um, that was earned. I mean, Perry earned that trust um, for me to know, <laughs> for me to know that he was a godly God, that he was spending time daily with God, that he loved me, that he wanted my best interest, um, that he was going to listen to me and take my opinions into account. Um, so all those things with his actions and his words is what earned um, my trust, which is not easily given. Um, and that translated into marriage where the leadership, headship, submission thing wasn't an issue because I knew I trusted him, I knew he loved me, I knew he wanted my best. And when 
you know, most of the time it would be if there's a disagreement. I mean, if you're agreeing on something, then it kind of doesn't really work. I mean, you're going in the same direction, you know, there's no big deal. But if there was like a disagreement where, you know, I think one thing, he thinks something else, and ultimately somebody has to make that decision, then I express my opinions and concerns and advice or whatever, give my information and input. And I know he listens. I know that he carefully is considering you know, his side, my side, that he's praying about it. And we've never had an instance where we disagreed about something and within time we still disagreed. And I just was like, well, okay, that's your decision. And, you know, I'll support you even though, you know, it always ends up that we, we're both on the same page and we're both on God's page at the end. Right. Um, and so I guess that's... I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I would, I would just say that submission, like I, I'm called to lead the home. That's my calling. When Adam and Eve sinned, Eve is the first one that ate the fruit, but Adam was the one that God called and held accountable in Genesis chapter 3. And so I understand it's my role, but I also understand that I'm completely stupid to make decisions for our family without consulting my wife, who in most cases has um, way more discernment than me and is wiser than me and actually can think through things way more logically. In, in our relationship, she's the logical person, I'm the emotional person. I mean, it's, it re- I mean, it's the way it is. And so that's why I discuss every decision with her and I run, I run the decisions through it. And that's what that God has protected me and our family from a lot of stupid decisions simply because I'm willing to listen to my wife and simply because at the end of the day, she knows you got this, you got this decision, I trust you. So. And I know that he loves me like Christ loves the church. Um, so that, that adds a lot. Yeah, I'm not like bulldozing her going, this is what we're going to do, shut right. up, woman. I mean, that just, that, that's not good. And if you have to proclaim or declare your leadership, then You're you, not. You, yes, you, you need to work on that yeah. with your wife. You should stop that. <laughs> I'm the leader. No, you're, you're not. Next question. What is your take on same-sex relationships? You want to take this yeah, one? Yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to take this one. <laughs> we agree. So, so yeah, we agree on the this. Same, same answer. Okay, so evangelicalism in, in America today has gotten goofy because of what uh, the media covers as far as evangelicals. Now, I consider myself to be a conservative, conservative meaning theologically, evangelical, meaning that I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, and I believe it's our job to reach the world through evangelism. But in the media, we're portrayed as the people that hate um, sex, beer, and gays. Like, literally, it's like they hate sex, beer, and gays. And I, I, just, I just want you to know, I, I don't hate gay people. I don't, I, don't, I don't hate sex either. I, mean, I don't really like beer, but I've had people tell me it's because I've never drank the right kind. And I'm like, it just, it tastes like pee. So no, I don't, I don't, so I don't, but if you, anyway, I preached a whole sermon on drinking one time. You can go back and listen to it. Um, but I don't hate gay people. I've had people say, pastors hate gay people. No, I, I, I can't stand religious people. And, but I don't hate gays. And listen, this is coming from a guy that was molested twice as a kid, both times by men. So I, I, I think I have a little authority to, to speak about this. I don't, I don't hate gay people. But homosexuality is listed in the scriptures as a sin. And so what scripture calls sin, the church needs to be willing to step up and call sin. Let me say this. It is put in the category of sexual sin. So homosexuality and adultery are sexual sin. The problem in the church is the people committing adultery look down on the people committing homosexuality. And that is hypocritical and judgmental and self-righteous and arrogant. Sexual sin is sexual sin. So the take on same-sex relationships is it's, I think it's wrong biblically. I think it's wrong biologically. I, I, I just think it's wrong, and I'm not basing that off of prejudice because I don't hate 
gay people. In fact, I've said this before, um, and if this, is, this is the point where somebody in the 1115 service walked out. Homosexuals are welcome in this church. In fact, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. And it's my prayer that, that, that through, through hearing the gospel, you will understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross to set you free from what you're enslaved in. I am glad you're here, and you're always welcome to attend this church. I don't hate you, and God doesn't hate you. But the sin that you commit did put Jesus on the cross, and you need to honestly evaluate and, and look at that. That's, that's my view, and that's our church's view on homosexuality. It's nice and tense in the room. Next question. How far is too far when it comes to parents, say, in the dating process? You know, I, I, I'm going to say this, and you, I, I don't know. We have a two-year-old. <laughs> I, I, seriously, I mean, she's not dating until she's 87. So I have, I have no, I, I mean, I, I know my experience from a youth pastor. Is per, I mean, parent, I've, I've seen parents that get way too involved in their 13-year-old little girl's relationship. And that's just ridiculous. Like you start crying when the boy breaks up with her and she's 13 and it's ridiculous. Um, but I, 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 don't, I would say as a parent, you need to declare biblical truth. You need to teach them why dating is in place, date, the importance of dating and, and, and the importance of not dating more specifically until you're at the right age to date. But we, we have a two-year-old. So the best I can do is share our <laughs> philosophy on this, which I'll let Lucretia share. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Yeah, I mean, and a lot. I mean, I, you know, what age child are you depend, are you on? I mean, if this child's grown and out of the house and on their own, um, I mean, yes, your parents' opinion is important, but you're kind of an adult living your own life on your own. Um, you know, if it's a teenager in the house, then, you know, I think the parents should have been involved. You know, even now we're involved in Karis and, and talking to her about truth and, um, you know, she, she likes Cinderella and she talks about Prince Charming. And so we're like, yeah, well, you know, Prince Charming was the guy that God had for Cinderella. That was, you know, the special guy that God had for her. And he'll have a special guy for you one day. And I told um, her that, that he, God didn't let him be born, <laughs> that he does not exist. Well, he might not yet. Well, he, he didn't. He might not yet. That's just our conversation that we've had uh, secretly. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, so, I mean, as the parent, you're you know, the authority figure in your child's life, you know, with ultimately God over that. And so I think as a parent, you know, you need to be involved in the standpoint of speaking truth to your child. And, um, you know, if, if you know something about this person that they want to date um, and your child's all starry eyed and, you know, they're wonderful, <laughs> You know, you need to tell them truth. Hey, did you know this and this about this person? I don't think this is a godly person. You know, you know so I just think it's being open and honest and having communication with your child. Um, you know, but at the same time, the point of parenting is train a child in the way that they should go. Mm, um, and so if you're so strict on your child that as soon as they're out from your care, they never see you again and never come back because you were so strict and oppressive, you know, that's a concern. But if you're so permissive and just whatever, do your own thing and you're not involved, then your child's just gonna have a lot of obstacles to overcome in life because they didn't really have that parent that was um, having, I guess, the role that God meant for them to have in their life. So I think there's a, a balance there of letting your child, depending on the age and the maturity that they're at, make their own decisions um, but also within the boundaries of, you know, what are they, what decisions are they mature enough to make? And is this going to be, you know, uh, more of a, you don't like the boy, you don't like the girl, or is this more of an issue of, you know, there's character issues in this person that your child shouldn't be, you know, dating in them. And, you know, when it becomes a biblical issue, then you, I mean, you need to step in, you need to say something, and hopefully you'll have that um, relationship with your child where they'll listen and trust you. You know, let me follow up on that. It, it, people think I was joking a few weeks ago when I talked about it. I'm dead serious. Um, when Karis does start dating, any boy that takes her out on a date will come and sit down and have a conversation with me, not on the night of the date, but several days before the date, so I can really pray and seek the Lord to see if that's what God wants for my daughter. 
Um, I will ask him how he met Jesus. I will look him in the eye. Um, if he shakes my hand and he gives me one of those really limp handshakes, we're not even going to the interview. He's out the door. <laughs> shake my hand like a man. If you don't try to break every bone in my hand when you shake it, you can't date my daughter. And, and I will have a serious heart-to-heart, face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball. That's another thing. If he can't look me in the eye, he can't date my daughter. I want a man to, to try to win my daughter's heart, not a boy. So, anyway, I'm serious about that. Woohoo! Next question. <laughs> Been living with this man for years, and I have a nine-year-old daughter. I haven't married him because I won't get disability if I do marry him. Um, so, you, so you're justifying your sin. Well, Pastor, that's hardcore. No, I, I just got to call that what it is. So a check from the government is more important than living holy before a righteous God. I I would say that you knew the answer to this question before. I'm not, I'm not, nor is this church going to give you permission to sin. There come there's an element of faith, Hebrews chapter eleven. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Your problem um, is that you think you have the solution. And you're not trusting God and saying, I'm going to do what's right and trust God on the other side to completely take care of me. And so I would say, stop trying to justify your sin. If you're supposed to get married, get married. And if you're not, move out. That's what I would say. Because I believe that's what Scripture would say. Because God's not looking at that going, oh, there's a loophole I didn't think of. Seriously. You can trust God to take care of you when you do what's right and honor him. He's got an incredible track record of, of taking care of people that are faithful to him. Hebrews 11. Just read through that. Oh, oh and what would you say, baby? Exactly what you said. Okay, good. I like it when you do that. Next question. <laughs> can you model a realistic way to break up with someone who I should not be in a relationship with? Yes. <laughs> this is pretend. Watch this. Pretend Lucretia and I are dating. I should not be in this relationship with you, so it's over. <laughs> I I don't I don't know. I mean I mean, I think that's great. You need to be short and sweet and to the point, um, but definitely. What's the commercial lately about the too easy and the too hard commercial? <laughs> the the boutonniere gets stapled on. And oh, you were yeah, laughing yeah. The other day. Bam! I love that commercial. I didn't know what you were talking about at <laughs> I first. I mean, you know, you, you don't want to be ambiguous and, you know, you want to be very clear and honest and go back to the truth and love. I mean, you want the truth. Um, you know, but, I mean, you don't necessarily have to tell the person every horrible thing about them. No, yeah, you don't go. tear them down. You suck as a person, and I can't stand being around you. I think God's wrath and judgment may fall upon you any minute, and when the fire falls, I do not want to get burned. You're probably going to hell. And, and you, like, don't go into any of that. Just, I just know this is not what God wants for us, so it's over. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> All right, we got time for two more. The guys doing the questions, two more. We're going to do two more, and then we're going to close in prayer. Um, so how can a single mother teach their daughter what a godly man is like? I think it's a great question. Uh, well, I mean, I think there's several, you know, you can have male role models, Christian men that are in your life. And that could be a brother, an uncle, uh, um, you know, I mean, I don't know what that looks like, a grandfather, you know, that could be um, a group of friends that you're with, if you're friends with another married couple or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, And then a lot, you know, just speaking truth, um, you know, if there's, uh, you know, things you see on TV or things you see in movies and just pointing out, you know, that's, that's a godly man or that's 
you know, <laughs> in the noble household lately, it's what's a pretty heart and what's not a pretty heart <laughs> um, with people. Um, and I mean, and I, it's hard. I mean, but you can, you know, you can go to scripture as far as, you know, just godly character, you know, and that's where it's male or female. Mm -hmm. um, having your child in church is great. Um, they're actually, I mean, in general, um, women tend to be, you know, more involved in children's lives and it tends to be an absence of the men and the father. Um, we have a lot of um, men and boys that volunteer in the children's area. Um, so I know that's huge for a lot of um, single moms, you know, that they bring their children to church and they have godly men back in the children's area that's working with their children. Um, you know, and, and that's a difficult situation to be in. I mean, it, it's hard. Um, I would definitely say do not marry someone that you should not marry just to have a male influence in your child's life. That's right. Yeah, because you're not damaged goods. You see yourself as damaged goods, and you can't see yourself that because to call yourself damaged goods means that your child is damaged goods. And you, you would never say that about your child, even though you may think that subconsciously. Um, if you're a single mom, I would just, I, my, my heart goes out to you. Uh, Lucretia had to go out of town for about 48 hours um, to about a week and a half ago, and it was me and Karis. Whole, like, holy cow. Oh my, I could not wait for Lucretia to get home. I mean, she's like, a pretty if, if, well behaved it, child. She's a very so well behaved child. It's but still a dang. Lot of work. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, because you, it's like, if you're a mom, it just, you, it, it's, it's always going. It's always going. You, you just never, you, you, you don't have a day off, ever. And so, I, I would say this is why the church is so important. This is why you need to have your child in church. Um, this is why you need to have your child plugged into the children's ministry. And this is where some of the men in the church can really step up. I mean, if you and your wife know a single mom and they have a kid and you're, and you're getting ready to take your kid to Chuck E. Cheese or something like that, why don't you call the single mom and say, let us take your kid and give her a night where maybe she can go sit in a chair with some peace and quiet while you take her kid and the kid actually gets to be around a real mother and a real father and another child. I mean, that's called ministry. And that's where the church can literally step up and be the church. So if you're, if you're a married couple and you know of a single mom that needs ministry, it is a great opportunity for us as believers to step up and say, I'm going to help with your child. I know that he left. I know he's gone for whatever reason, but we're going to step up um, and, and, and minister to that child. So I, I would say it's a great opportunity for the church to be the church and for you to get your, your child to church um, as often as you can. So. And really make sure that you're not bitter towards men. Oh, yeah. um, because That's you good. don't want to teach that to your child. Last question. Do you think it's okay for me to... Sp um, do you, oh, wow. Do you think it is okay for me to spend the night with my boyfriend and then get up and come to church the next day with him? Okay, um, well, just to answer the question, no, it's not okay, but um, the first thing that struck me with this question is I think you know it's not okay, and I think maybe you're not um, willing to have that tough conversation with this guy and tell him, so you want us to do that? I'll tell um, him. <laughs> but yes, yeah, spending the night with someone you're not married to um, is sin and it's not honoring God and it's not doing anything um, for your relationship with this guy um, because your relationship with this guy is based um, in living in sin. Um, so no, it's not okay and you need to separate, go your separate ways or get married, <laughs> um, you know, commit or go your separate ways or, you know, whatever, but continuing to spend the night together is not going to work. <laughs> and it's not honoring to your future marriage either. That's good. My answer? <laughs> no. No. At no point in the scriptures are we ever 
commanded to compromise just so we can get the dude to come to church the next day. If he is saying to you, I will go to church with you if you will sleep with me the night before, that's equivalent to the serpent saying to Eve, if you eat this apple, your eyes will be opened. He's making promises that in the end are going to come up empty. You're dating a snake. Are, are you hearing me? Because he's saying you've got to compromise to win my heart. And if he's a man of God, and if you're here, listen, this is small. If you are a man of God, you would never ask a woman to compromise to get you to come to church. That is weak. That is weak. I'm glad you're here if you're here, but that is weak. And if you're the girl, listen to me. You're better than that. You are a daughter of the king of the universe, and he is not asking you to crawl in bed with a dude because God, if he wants to reach that boy, I called him a boy. If God wants to reach that boy, he can. And he probably won't until you get out of the way and stop leading him that all Christians will compromise just to have somebody on their arm. So you need to knock it off. Because you're better. Listen, you are so much better than that. And you don't have to stoop to that level. Please. Don't do that anymore. Where did y'all go on your honeymoon? <laughs> we went on a cruise, didn't we, to the we Bahamas? Cruise it was, to the Bahamas. Cruise to the Bahamas. It was fun, and I would highly recommend a cruise if you've never been on a cruise, simply because the food. <laughs> Praise God. So we went, went on a cruise. Next question. That was good. That was easy. How do you feel about your daughter having tattoos and piercings when she is old enough? <laughs> we might have a slightly different view on this, so I'm going to let Lucretia <laughs> answer for us. Okay, I think the key is when she's old enough, so, you know, when she's old enough to make her own decisions, um, you know, my only thing is, especially tattoos, they're pretty much permanent. Um, you can pay a lot of money, like multiple times what you paid to get them to remove them, so you might as well consider them permanent. And so my only thing with a tattoo is, you know, when you're old enough and that's your decision and this is not like, okay, all the friends are doing it, so I want to do it. You know, this is I want a tattoo is, you know, this is going to be permanent. And if you think that 10 and 20 years from now you're still going to love this tattoo and want this tattoo, that is totally up to you. But I think you just need to, you know, think about it and think about the fact that it is permanent and is this something I want um, when I'm older and as you get older your body changes so think about where you place tattoos and when when things start looking different how that tattoo is going to start looking and is that something that you know that you really want or um, is that just kind of more of a passing interest um, as far as the piercing same thing I mean you know if if she wants and I well I guess some things um, some things are pierced for different reasons. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> you might not want to go there, but other, <laughs> other, other than that, you know, that's up to her. You know, when she's old enough to make her own decision, as long as, you know, she realizes that, you know, there can be infections and there can be, you know, problems with that. But, you know, if that's what you want and you realize the risk and the benefit and you want to, you know, have that's so what's your answer? No, I, I, the, the thing I think we're going to, we'll probably disagree on with the piercings is like where she's old, because we've already had the discussion about her ears pierced, and we hadn't really set an age, and you think the age should be higher, and I think the age should be lower, so the age will be higher. Um, 
we're going to compromise there. But um, I, and it's her body. I don't care. I mean, I mean, seriously, um, I have talked, and this this will be a lot of fun. I've talked about getting a tattoo. Um, please don't send me your Leviticus verse. Uh, I know that one. It also says in that same passage that do not wear clothes made out of two kinds of material. So if you're telling me not to get a tattoo and you have on cotton and linen tonight, you're a hypocrite. And so I'm trying to save you from that. I, I just, if I ever get one, I want it to be really cool and really awesome and really mean something. So if I ever get one, I will, I will not hide it. I will come out here um, and just bam, and there, there it is right there on my arm. So anyway, but I will not go sleeveless because I don't have the muscles for that. <laughs> What's okay to do or use to keep your sex life going in a marriage? <laughs> Y'all ask the question, <laughs> and Lucretia's going to answer it. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, in all, it's in all caps, baby. It is. They're, they're very, yelling they're, that question. They're very emphatic. I want to know. <laughs> Broke their thumbs texting that one in. Um, uh, well, I think for the main part, there's, there's two parts to that. Um, and there's a balance between the two. And one part is that the marriage bed um, is undefiled. I mean, Hebrews 13, 5. <laughs> um, you know, God, God created marriage. God created sex. He meant for it to be beautiful and wonderful. Um, so between a husband and wife, you know, what you um, mutually agree upon um, to do in your bedroom, you know, that's your choice and your decision. Um, but at the same time, you have two individual different people and, you know, what happens inside the bedroom is, you know, a small percent of intimacy within a marriage. The majority of the percent is outside of the bedroom and it's the communication, it's the emotional intimacy, it's, you know, more than just the act of, of having intercourse and having sex together. And... When you're in the bedroom, what you've agreed on as a couple, meaning we mutually love and respect each other, and both of us want to try this, or, or you know, we do try it, and then we say, okay, well, one of us doesn't like it, but the other one does. Well, you've got to respect the person that says, you know, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not liking this. This isn't going to work. So you have to mutually love and respect each other and respect each other's opinions and communicate. Um, so you kind of have to balance those two out. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say two, two things that, that motivates this question. The first, and the thing that scares me about this question, is it's asked, maybe, um, this question is asked by a lot, by men, and if you dig down, dig down on the issue as to why he's asking that question, it's because he's watching porn, um, and he sees some things he would like to try with his wife. Um, and I would tell you that, that that's got to get out of your relationship. Like, you cannot use pornography um, as the key to unlocking some kind of magical formula in your sex life. Um, it's destroying you, bro, and you gotta, you've got to get that out. That's, that's what I would say. Sec second thing I would say is um, a man specifically should never try to dominate his wife um, in the context of sex, but he should seek to love her and treat her like a woman in every uh, way, in every sense, of, in, in, like in every way. And so if you're doing something that is degrading or demeaning to your wife, I would tell you to stop it and repent of that because it's just wrong. Um, the third thing I would say to kind of echo what Lucretia says is a, a married couple, the, the thing that makes the sex life work is communication. You've got to be willing to have open, honest dialogue. If you're a married lady and your husband does something that you do not like, you've got to tell him, I did not like that and vice versa. In the Song of Solomon, um, and I've shared this all day because the, something like this has came up all day. I, if you're a married couple, you should read the Song of Solomon together often and put it into practice. Um, but but it's, a, it's a book where the husband and the wife communicate to one another about sex. They're having a conversation about sex. 
Um, the beloved is when the woman speaks. Lover is when the man speaks. And I know some of you have probably been taught that the Song of Solomon is an allegory or a metaphor about Christ and the church and his love. Uh uh-uh. uh. Jesus never really asked the church to blow on his garden. It says that in the Song of Solomon. You understand that, don't you? Come blow on my garden. Like, what? well, it's, it's the wind of the Holy Spirit. No, uh-uh. <laughs> You're a pervert and you should knock it off. Like, they communicate. Let me just read to you. Um, he's checking her body out in Song of Solomon chapter 7. And in verse 8, he said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. May your breast be like the clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. Um, That has nothing to do with Jesus and his church. He's talking about her breast. It's honest, open communication. And as far as um, what to use, (laughs) I've got a great answer. Like God equipped you with what you need to use, bro. (laughs) And if, anyway... I've got a great answer for that, the what you should use, the creativity that God gave you. Amen. That that was good. That's better than what I was going to say. And and just, I know that this issue is out there, um, and Perry kind of mentioned pornography with men, but I know, you know, couples that say, oh, well, we need to watch this together, uh, you know, to, to make our sex life exciting or creative or you know, it's gotten old or whatever. And, you know, I mean, look at God, creator of the whole entire world and what he's created and he made us in um, his image. And so he's given us creativity. And if you really focus that on your spouse and knowing your spouse and knowing what they love and appreciate, um, you know, your sex life will be unlimited. So. <laughs> and, and Song of Solomon, I'm serious, Song of Solomon, they, I mean, they, they do some fun stuff in there. <laughs> All right, next question. This is my question. Why does God put so many bad relationships in my life? I would say God's not putting them there. I really would tell you that. And I don't, I don't know who wrote that. It looks probably like a, a, a girl or a really desperate guy. Um, I would say God doesn't put bad relationships in your life. If you enter into a relationship, if you would have listened to God in the first place, you might not have so many bad relationships. That's what I would say. Would you say anything about that? Looks like it's your choice. Yeah. And I know it's hardcore, but I'm going to answer your questions honestly. Um, I, I, because I, I, I want to honor. I want to honor Jesus, and I want to honor you tonight. So I would say it's probably not God putting those bad relationships. I would tell you to um, um, really listen to the Holy Spirit and do not grieve him whenever it comes to a relationship. And you probably won't have so many bad ones. And, and maybe just to add to it, I mean, maybe you just need to slow down. I mean, maybe you don't really know this person and then you enter in a relationship and then found out that they weren't who you needed to be with and they don't have godly character and, you know, not a, a man or woman of God. So, you know, maybe it's slow down, get to know the person before you jump into a relationship to figure out if you even need to be in a relationship with the person. That's, that's good. Next question. How are we as women not supposed to be persistent <laughs> with men when they don't act like men in the Bible and pursue us? Well, I think there's, there's two um, men-women relationships here. One is um, you're not married. <laughs> Um, And if you're not married and the guy is not acting like a godly man and he's not pursuing you, then you don't need to be with that guy anyway. Um, If you are married, then you have made a commitment before God to be with this man for life. And I think there's a lot of prayer involved. Um, There's a lot of just being a godly woman praying and reading your Bible and let God shape and mold you so that your husband can see God and Jesus in you and be drawn to that. Um, Nagging is definitely not the way to go about it. Um, And so there's a fine line between speaking truth and love and letting um, him see Jesus in you and 
you living your life in a way that honors God. And Bible, you know, definitely says that when you're in that relationship together, if one of you is a believer and one is not, that, you know, you still made that um, covenant, that commitment of marriage before God, and you're to honor that and um, live out Christ so that that person can see Jesus in you. You know, the way you're supposed to be persistent is you allow him to pursue, and you, you pray for God to do something in him because if you, um, if you nag him into pursuing, the pursuit will stop. If this is written from a married woman, I would tell you to be patient. And if this is a single woman, I would, I would tell you to stop whining. All right, next question. People say I'm too independent and confrontational, that it's too intimidating to guys. Can a guy really not handle a girl who knows what she wants? Bam! <laughs> um, wow, okay. Again, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I just had Kelly Clarkson, Miss Independent, go off in my head. <laughs> I don't know why, but it just happened. And I'm sorry. All right, so, so go, baby. Um, well, I think, I think there's kind of two aspects to this or two ways to look at it. Um, and one is there's nothing wrong with being independent with you know, not being the princess who needs to be rescued. Um, I would think that being confident and independent and, you know, kind of having a plan with your life would be very attractive. Um, and that just means that to have a godly guy that's going to pursue you, that, you know, it's going to have to be a guy that really can be the man of God and lead you in that relationship because, the other guys just, you know, are going to be too intimidated and they're not even going to be an option because they're not even going to pursue you. Um, so you're kind of getting the better end of the guys to choose from um, that God brings into your life. So I think there's an aspect of can a guy really not handle a girl who knows what she wants? Um, the right guy can, um, mm. but you've got to wait for that right guy. Um, at the same time, I see um, this question saying, too independent and confrontational. Um, and so the confrontational, um, I guess, makes me wonder. I think that, you know, in any relationship, in friendships and in dating um, and in marriage, that there's truth and there's love. And so I wouldn't use the word necessarily confrontational. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the person was asking, but I think that um, you do sometimes have to... Um, confront someone in a manner of here's truth here's love I'm trying to keep you accountable I see some th things I'm concerned about and I'm doing this out of a heart of love if it's confrontation out of a heart of I'm right and you're wrong and I'm trying to cause dissension and trouble um, then that is not very attractive to a godly guy um, so you don't want to be the girl that's constantly you know causing dissension picking arguments causing disagreements and fights and it's kind of disagreeable to be around um, so I'm not really sure which aspect this question is coming from. Um, so I think, you know, God does call us to, uh, you know, live in peace with each other and have a sweet spirit and um, to speak truth tempered with love. Um, so, like I said, I'm not, not sure kind of two ways I see the question. Yeah, Lucretia was, would be, would have been categorized by many as independent and confrontational. Um, like you and and that that really I mean that that attracted me. I was like, wow, there's a woman that doesn't need a man. I'm going to fight to win her heart, and I did, and I still do. And then confrontational. Um, what some people okay, confrontational is either you speak the truth or you're a self righteous witch. And 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 so that I don't I don't know which way that goes. But if you speak the truth, that's one thing. But if you're always telling people that they don't measure up to your standard, then you should repent of that because that's not good. Um, but I would say if you are a confident woman that loves Jesus and you have a plan in your life that does not include a man and that seems to be intimidating, then it's probably intimidating the right kind of guy and you need him to be intimidated because it prevents you from wasting a lot of your Friday and Saturday nights. Next question. How should a girl handle a guy pursuing her who has received victory over a homosexual lifestyle? Is it wrong for her to be very hesitant? You want me to go with that one? Sure, you can start. Okay, you, uh, start, okay. 
Well, I might have something to add. No, you. I might not. Okay. <laughs> That's like you might get this right. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. I, I know what you. I love you, baby. Um, here's here's what you, you got to figure out if if you're the girl that or to the girl that asked this question. Uh, let me let me kind of back up and talk about homosexuality for a second because. It's going to get asked, and so it's been asked in, in just about every service. And so evangelicalism in the South especially has been looked at as kind of goofy. I consider myself as a conservative, conservative meaning theologically. Um, it has nothing to do with polit- politics, theologically. A, a conservative evangelical mean that I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, and we should do all we can as a church to reach people for Jesus. I can, that's, I can, but we've been stereotyped as people that hate um, beer, sex, and gays. Um, and, and that's just not true. I don't hate beer. Um, and I preached a whole sermon on alcohol. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really like beer. It tastes like pee um, to, to me. But if you, I mean, I, anyway, so um, I don't hate sex. Uh, and I don't, and I don't hate gays. Like literally, uh, I, I've, talk to homosexuals that like uh, you guys hate us and listen this is coming from a man that was molested twice as a boy by men and so I think I have a little authority to talk here where I I don't hate gay people I don't and and so that that's one of the things that the church has to because because we go well there's homosexuals and I'm like well what about the adulterers because homosexuality is sin, it is a sin, it is listed in the scriptures as a sin, and so if scripture calls it a sin, I've got to call it a sin because that's what the scriptures say, but so is adultery, and what is sad inside the church is we allow the adulterers to look down on the homosexuals. When sexual sin is sexual sin, period. And so I would say if you're a homosexual and you're here tonight, I'm glad you're here. You're always welcome to attend New Spring Church. Now, if you go through a membership class, we will talk to you about the lifestyle that you are in. And then there's some deeper issues there that we will have to get into. But you're always welcome to attend this church because nobody hates you here. And if they do, then they, they, they've got some problems and they, they have no right to judge you. And so, so using that as the platform that, that I don't hate gay people, we don't hate. In fact, the pastor friends that I talk to, we never even talk bad about homosexuals. We talk bad about religious people. And that's probably a sin we need to repent of too, all right? But I'm struggling with that one and so to answer the question how should a girl handle a guy pursuing her who's received victory over a homosexual lifestyle I would say if God has forgiven him you can forgive him too and if God has forgiven him you should forgive him um you should be patient with him you should make sure he's achieved the victory over this like if he just stopped it yesterday and he's pursuing you today give that some time um because it is it wrong for her to be hesitant not re- I think there's a, I think you just want to be careful and make sure that he's been, he's totally repentant uh, of his sin but if he is um if God's forgiven him you should forgive him um and allow the pursuit to continue as God leads that pursuit that's I don't have anything else to add great answer dang oh I mean, uh, <laughs> need to stop now all right next question in marriage how do you Compromise when you completely disagree. How do y'all work through this issue? We never disagree. Because I'm right. No, I'm just kidding. I, you, I mean, you, you take the lead on this. Um, how do we compromise when we completely disagree? Um, honestly, there's not been a lot of times that we've completely disagreed, but um, there definitely have been times, and um, one of the things um, for me is I will speak my mind, um, give my opinion, give my advice, kind of, um, you know, I guess if you want to make my case, my logical, rational arguments for, you know, why I think what I think, and listen to Perry and what he says, um, and after that, I mean, it's just kind of prayer. I mean, ultimately, I leave the decision up to him and support the decision that he makes. And that's because, you know, he has earned my trust. And submitting to him in our marriage is not an issue. And I know he loves me. I know he wants my 
Um, I know that he has my best interest at heart, that he's not just how can I get what I want, um, and that he's going to prayerfully consider the situation. And we haven't ever had a time where, you know, after initially having the disagreement that, you know, at whatever point later, after both, in, both of us thinking about it, praying about it, listening to each other's side, that we haven't agreed. Right. Um, and so... I guess, you know, that is how we work through it. So, you know, we're honest and we communicate and pray about the decision. And um, ultimately, God's always brought us together on the, on the same page, which is his page. Yeah, I would say when we completely disagree, I understand that ultimately the decision is going to be mine. I don't say that with my chest out. I say that very humbly because God will hold me accountable as the man for that decision. And so I don't take that lightly. But if Lucretia and I are in a discussion and she completely disagrees with me, I am a moron to proceed with that decision if I do not. I need to stop. I need to pray. I need to seek the Lord with all my heart because he has put her in my life um, to help me, to assist me. Um, and, and by listening to her, it's literally prevented me from making some very foolish and stupid decisions um, I'm, I'm like that even in the leadership of this church. I don't make any decisions without consulting at least four separate people. And if we can't agree, I continue to press through that and pray through that because God puts people in our lives to protect us from stupidity. And, and, and uh, husbands, I would just challenge you to really, really seek the wisdom of your wife because she has some, she has some I know Lucretia has just some wisdom. And so we talk through that. We don't ever let the sun go down on us while we're angry. Um, we've never gone to bed mad at each other. We have had conversations until 2 o'clock in the morning, um, but we do not go to bed mad. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, do not let the sun go down while you're angry because that gives the devil a foothold. And I just refuse to let him climb all over my marriage. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that's, the way we handle, that's the way we handle that. And we also keep short accounts. So Very short accounts. If there's something little that's bothering me, you know, I don't just put it aside because I don't want to have conflict. I just go ahead and bring it up and quantify, you know, this is not a big deal, but I want to tell you about it. And then that way it's over and done with, because if I don't, then, you know, little things happen and right. build on each other. And then, you know, something else comes up and, you know, you bring up all these little things and it's like, well, I didn't know you didn't tell me. But the timing, you use, like you don't ever just unload on me on a Sunday night when I've came in from preaching all day, you know, Hey, now that you've preached all day <laughs> uh, and you're at your lowest, let me tell you all the things that I think you did wrong. I mean, this, <laughs> so timing's important for that. Cool. Next question. If you've been raped, you're still counted as a virgin. Um, if, if you've been raped, if you're a female and you've been raped, um, and I got an email this past week from a girl that, that had been raped, and it just broke my heart ripped my heart out 